Yes, be in the agenda this time, right? No, I didn't. We did last time, so I wasn't sure. No, that was, uh, I wanted an update because you were new. Um, but feel free, uh, there, you have to talk to Barry about this. I don't even remember if I put it on the agenda or not. But Barry wants to talk to him. Barry wants to have a little bit of a conversation about uh, improving working group behavior. Including working group what? Like just behavior. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, what what we as a community can do that can, to help make this a friendly place. So that might be something that uh, you might feel inspired to speak about. Oh, I'm on the wrong day. This is on Tuesday. This whole thing having this thing on Tuesday is confusing me. <laughs> um, I've sent um, some slides to Francesca that I'm using for the right person group chairs that also has some behaviors, but uh, I don't know if it's interesting. She said she shares, she'll share it in the whatever document she uses. It's one What's your mother to say? I don't want you to say anything. Okay, good. Let's do this when you take a note. Huh? Yeah, I can just, you know, like help coach her. It's not much to say.
This works. This works. Oh, it works. Hello? Oh. Okay. Can we uh, begin to gather, begin to be a little bit quieter? Deep cleansing voice. <laughs> Lead everybody in a moment of silence. Okay. We about ready? Excellent. So um, I'd like to work, welcome you to the uh, Working Group Chairs Forum here at IETF 104. Um, the uh, co-chairs of the EDU team currently, Miriam Cohn and I, the first thing I wanted to do is actually to publicly thank her, because I have no other opportunity to do this, for over 15 years of working in the EDU team. Um, and it, it's... Um, she has done us a great service, and we owe her some gratitude. So I'd like a round of applause for Miriam. <laughs> so. Thank you. <laughs> um, I will say it's, it's sort of an example of how you end up doing things in the IETF. I went to a boss that she was chairing. I could have sworn I said I would take the minutes, and the next thing what I had actually said was, I would co-chair Edgy with her, which I don't actually recall ever saying, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is the Working Group Chairs Forum. It's, it's still part of the IETF. So here's our note well. Um, the, our agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Working Group Chair Design Training, Working Group Chair Training Design Team, which is looking at the organization and content of all of our training materials for Working Group Chairs. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the agenda time experiment and also just scheduling in general. Uh, and then we're going to have an open mic. So with that, I would like Francesca. So, hi everybody, my name is Francesca Parombini, and together with Tal Misrai, I am uh, co-leading this uh, effort. So this is uh, all the, the team names is written there. So this started after IETF 103. So the goal of this design team is to perform an inventory of the existing training material, such as, and including website, data tracker, wiki, etc. Um, our first goal is to map the gaps in this material and to gather ideas for how and where the material should be organized and also to um, uh, identify any ideas for filling the gaps. So the output of this team should be to draft a list of what should be included in a basic set of, um, of material that new working group chairs should uh, have. So we think this is a subset of the above. Um, this is the set of um, inventory we have done so far. So um, we have gone through all of these, or most of these, and uh, make a summary of what is there and what is not there, what we would have liked to see. Um, in general, as a summary, we think that there is a lot of information that can be found in all of these places. Um, the problem is that it's not optimally organized. It's not very easy to find. And there is some overlap information and some outdated information. So I just wanted to focus on, on two particular resources that we looked at. We, we thought these were the most um, important and with most uh, information in it. One is the working group chair resources that at, at itf.org slash chairs. And uh, this page links uh, several resources about procedure and tools. And it's really for anybody, uh, not only for working group chairs. And there is a section there about new chair resources, which has a link to the wiki. Second is the wiki. So the working group chairs wiki, which is a great place to start for new chairs. Um, uh, some information is, uh, links are outdated. Some information is missing. And it's way more info than just as a new working group chair you would want to see. So there is a lot of details there as well. So just to go through the wiki, um, 
a bit more in detail. Uh, here I listed, so the, the main bullets are uh, the sections in the wikis and the sub bullet are what we thought uh, are gaps. So there is an introduction. We would like to see a new section, this, so this is a gap, about obligations and responsibilities for work, working group chairs. That is missing right now. Um, there is a section about rules. Um, so so we, in there we would like to see maybe a summary of what a new working group chair must read. Uh, that's a, a BCPs and, and references. Then um, about tools, uh, we identified some, some, some more gaps like uh, info and links to meeting material management. Mitico, Jabber, and Etherpad are now missing. Uh, text on how to use them for, for people who have not seen those before. And links to mailing list archive proceedings and, and this useful link would have been good to have there. Then there is a section about non-tools, and there it would have been nice to have some intro about how to plan and run a meeting, consensus, and uh, the role of the chair in between meetings. So again, this information can be found often somewhere else, but it's just, uh, this is what the new working group chair would like to see all in one place. Um, then there is a section about document state, and again, some intro about the document state process would have been appreciated. This can be found in another um, resource that is the slides on leadership training. I think that was an EDU uh, training material. Finally, so, some, more, some more section about working draft, herding, uh, soliciting implementation feedback, email addresses, holding effective working group meetings, and there is a really nice meeting checklist and that would be nice to have highlighted and uh, other working group chairs forum, and then there is some topics to add, um, which are quite important, I think, uh, as well for new working group chairs, such as how to schedule an interim and others. So for, for this design team, uh, we have now met three times, um, virtually, and the proposed next steps would be to start creating an index for, this, for the working group chair training, and we think the wiki is a good place to start. Um, we would like to see a structure to separate between the basic must know info, which is useful for people who are starting as new working group chairs, and the rest where there is a lot of details and uh, any working group chairs can find information. And then, yeah, point to all the resources in order of priority. Then we should uh, review and resolve the overlapping material and the resolve the missing and outdated information. So you can help. You can identify more gaps, anything we have missed. So we have um, a Google Drive folder when we have a document called gaps. And there we have listed anything that brainstorming, whatever we think. Uh, yeah, it's, we, we couldn't find information about. Or you can also send um, to the chair's mailing list. Or you can also contact me and, and be part of the, of the design team and, and, and uh, participate in the interim calls as well. Thank you. Yeah, is there any questions? Tiny red button at the bottom. Seven, there we go. Um, so two things. First, I didn't see on your list of materials that you had already looked at. I know the routing area directors have been running uh, working group sort of sessions, training sessions. I know I've participated in one. Um, and they've got recordings of, uh, I think, if not all of them, a lot of them. Uh, so that might actually be a good source of material. That would be great. I don't know if we've seen those particularly, but yeah. Um, the question I had was one about um, doing some sort of in-person training. Is that under consideration for new chairs? Do we know what the churn of new chairs is? Would there be enough folks to, at every IETF meeting or every few IETF meetings, have a 
you know, in-person kind of training and Q&A? So uh, that was not the goal of this design team. The idea was that the output would be like uh, a set of material that the chair could read. It, with me personally, I had this training by my AD. Uh, uh, um, yeah. I, I do think that's something we could add to a list of things we might want to consider. And, and you might want to, we might want to add that to our gaps. Yeah. Like, yeah. like maybe there should be some training, but. It, it, it will come as no surprise to anyone that I'm a ham and uh, I'm perfectly happy to do consensus discussion as part of that, so. Right, there, there, is a, uh, there is an old tutorial that was done on working group chair training, it's, it's, and that's one of the things that was in the inventory. Alyssa Cooper, um, thank you very much for doing all of this work, uh, definitely much needed. Um, just in response to Pete, uh, the, work, the idea of doing a regular training for chairs um, has, was discussed in the IESG after the last IETF um, open mic at the plenary, um, you know, something like once a year and recording it for other people who could see it other times. Like, we don't really know what the cadence would be. Um, but I think, like, once this content is organized in a um, straightforward fashion, it seems like a logical thing if we can find volunteers to do it. Ben Kadek, so Alyssa, was that really highly overlapping with this? I mean, I, we had talked about training, but was that intended to be for continuing training versus for initial you know, first-time chairs? Uh, I mean, why would you limit it if somebody wanted to come to the training? Like, <laughs> yeah, and I, well, I think when we talked about it, it was for new chairs, right? Oh no, your memory is definitely better than mine, so. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I was pretty groggy that session, but my memory says that it was for, for continuing uh, training. Oh. I mean, clearly I, I, both are useful and you know, I would support doing both. Um, I don't know where the relative priorities lie. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, Barry? Hi, we have there are two things that we've been discussing in the ISG that I'd like to bring up here. One is the uh, free time, the, the, the unstructured time, and the, what the, how that has affected scheduling. Uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion about that, and I just, uh, I don't really have much to say about it. I'd like to turn this to you and say, let's have a discussion for, can you time it to 15 minutes for right now, and this, we'll cut it off at that point, of the need for unstructured time, how that balances with the need for working group structured time and what effect this has had on, on conflicts and other issues with scheduling. Uh, please come to the microphone and talk to me about this for right now. And while nobody's getting up to the microphone, I'll say the, the experimenting with this unstructured time in different ways by putting it on Friday in Bangkok and putting it on Wednesday here has been the result of comments from people saying they needed the unstructured time. It may be that non-working group chair participants and working group chairs have a different view of the need for this and how it affects your working groups. Here we go. People are coming up. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Rich Sauls. Um, I'm curious because this seems to have been a concern of the ISG growing, but non uh, constant drumbeat over the past times, and I know you're on and off the ISG, so you may not know. But I'd like to know where they're getting the input or hearing that this is coming from, maybe divided between chairs and non-chairs or other or the people. I just, I hadn't heard much of a request from that or seen much of a request for that in the little area where I work. So I'm just curious if there's a way to characterize the input that the ISG has gotten such that repeated experiments are useful and necessary or whatever. Okay. Uh, one, one thing I know is some of it comes from surveys, but uh, Alyssa, why don't you jump the line and 
give a better answer to that as someone with continuity. Yeah, so in terms of like the, between last time and, and this time, we based the decision to try this ex try some experiment with unstructured time again off of the ITF 103 survey, um, showing like two thirds of people who filled out the survey um, thought that unstructured time could be valuable midweek. So we put some unstructured time in the agenda midweek. Um, prior to that though, before the 103 experiment, I think it was more ad hoc. Um, we had a uh, mailing list discussion in various places. Um, I don't know if Michael Richardson this year um, had you know, been suggesting lots of different ways that um, we could experiment with the agenda and other people coming to us on the side and saying, hey, should we try this or that? Um, so again, just sort of threw something out there for 103, which nobody liked, which is fine. Um, but that was more ad hoc to come to the conclusion to, to try that. Hi, Tommy Pauly. Um, so I, I think as far as the experiment from last time to this time, it certainly seems to be that the Wednesday location is gonna be more successful based on what I've seen of people scheduling things um, in various groups. And I think as both a chair and a participant, I think this unstructured time is looking to be very valuable. Um, it, to some degree, means that your week gets even more filled up. But um, these are useful things. So in one example, like as a chair, I've, it's nice to have these outlets for things that would otherwise become rat holes and take up a lot of time in the group to have focused areas go off and meet and be able to come back and report. That seems to be, very, be a very valuable thing. And then also, as a contributor to a working group, I've, uh, I have a side meeting that we're doing that would not be appropriate to take away time from the main working group, but is still very relevant to a subset of the people there. So I think it is a very useful thing to continue doing, and it seems like we're going the right direction for how to manage the experiment. So Robert Sparks, um, just uh, adding a little bit of um, data to Alyssa's answer to Rich, the, um, the requests for unstructured time were happening like in these working group chairs meetings and at the plenary. You know, it was it, it, it's something that um, it has been asked for um, quite a lot. Um, I have an uh, individual comment that I'd like to throw in. I think that the um, ability to assess the experiments would be enhanced. It would be easier to understand whether things are working or not. Um, if and it would be easier for people to take advantage of it if the shape of of the experiment at, at a given meeting were telegraphed earlier than it has been um, so far. So. so I think yeah, the first thing that should happen is that we should decide what we're experimenting with, write that down, and then write a report on it so we can see the res the results. Because I think there's supposed to be reports for experiments that we run on process in the IETF. Just like my recollection of the process. Um, this has been better than the previous one. The previous one either gave uh, people a day off um, to do some tourism between that and the IEEE meeting that followed, or it gave people the opportunity to sort of uh, leave at, uh, halfway through Thursday. That was a disastrous way of doing it, in my view. I, I think we understand that, yes. <laughs> this one is a bit better because actually it's quite tiny because uh, of the unstructured time, there's a really first class tutorial that anyone who ever wants to know what a router looks like and, and, and the implications that has on their work should probably go to. So we've kind of used, we're really only down to about two hours of unstructured time um, if we start to put uh, tutor decent tutorials in the first half of that uh, remaining time. However, I am really worried about the number of overlaps we have, the number of times that um, there have been two or more working groups that I ought to go to, that I can't go to, and if we'd used this t unstructured time for it, then maybe there would have been less uh, clashes. And for me, that is the most uh, difficult part of the, uh, the experiment. And finally, on scheduling, you know, we created the infrastructure that allowed big data to happen. 
why can't we do some decent big data collection, like who was at which meetings, who was writing which drafts, and what the overlap set really is, as opposed to what happens at the moment. The chairs guess, the ADs sort of sometimes guess a bit more uh, for them, but not always, and the net result is that lots of people who should be in the same room at the same time aren't, and so we don't do the work we should do. Hey, don't, don't sit down, Stuart. I have a question for you on the second thing you said. Okay. Um, do you think, do you have any, okay, is it, you, is it a perception or have you actually looked at your schedule? Now, I know there are several working groups where there are two that I'd like to I, be I, believe, I believe that. What, yes. I, what I'm asking is, is it demonstrably worse this time because of the unstructured time than it has been at other meetings? That's the question. Well, I, 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 let's spin it the other way around. There was the unstructured time was time that we could have used to do some more yes. conflicting in, yes. and we're not taking advantage of that. And the, the really fundamental thing here is the face-to-face -face time. There's many non-structured times available. There are four evenings at least. There are lots of lunch hours. Um, you know, we've always managed to work the unstructured time within the unscheduled time in the normal format of the meeting. So uh, I have not quantified whether I've lost any more this time, but it seems to be pretty reasonable to expect that there were four hours that we could have used to deconflict some of the meetings. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dave Waltermeyer. Um, has there been any thought about maybe doing a hum or something during the plenary, asking people... Um, some question you know, relating to this this topic to get a broader you know sense of of the room because it sounds it, I fear a little bit that maybe we're talking to ourselves that there's you know some you know confirmation bias around around these kinds of topics it'd be interesting to see where the where the consensus is in the room as far as you know the general participation in in the IATF maybe that might be a way to to get a better sense. It would not surprise me at all should this topic come up again in the plenary at the open mic. But I think there's a difference between talking about it at the mic um, and actually getting a sense within the room as to whether they share that opinion. Okay. Ben Kaduk, uh So with respect to Stuart's point about overlap or, or conflicts, um, I mean, yes, we have this for our block of time, but if we did want to schedule structured working group sessions during that, uh, we would need to leave an hour and a half for lunch, and then that leaves uh, one, maybe two slots that we could schedule working groups in. And so, you know, if you have eight conflict, you know, eight conflicts, uh, eight sessions where there's conflicts now, where you want to be in two or more things, uh, we could only fix two of those at most, maybe one, or maybe only one. Uh, and so, you know, how how big of an impact is? one chunk of unstructured time really having on you know, the conflict list. Alyssa Cooper, so uh, with respect to the interaction between the unstructured time and the conflicts, there's actually the same number of slots available because we slightly changed the length and the distribution of the lengths of slots in order to make the unstructured time work and that was true both at 103 and here. So strictly speaking, if there is a perceived increase in conflicts, it doesn't have to do with the number of slots available because the number of slots is the same, or it, it can it can accommodate the the number of requests that we um, that we got both times. Um, as far as humming at the plenary, uh, we have I think between unstructured time and conflicts, five questions drafted for the 104 meeting survey about this topic, and they're all multiple choice with like at least four choices each. So I would be a little bit reluctant to try to gauge um, that matrix of opinions in the plenary. It would be a lot of hums. Um, but I am. we have a slide in the ISG uh, portion of the presentation where we're going to talk about this and really strongly encourage people to fill out the meeting survey, including those questions. Um, and we're going to send it out uh, a little bit closer to when the meeting ends to increase the likelihood that people will do so. And I think that is maybe a, a little bit of a better basis to um, extract broad-based opinions um, than humming in the plenary.
Ironically, um, Wednesday afternoon is my most conflicted period all this week. Um, and I think it's actually I over. Oh, I think it's actually a little bit because of um, the format of providing that big block of time without the usual schedule function, how that works. So a number of things I'm interested in and that my working group is interested in, um, you know, self-organized for these side meetings, which is great, but then they made like a three-hour agenda, which is a little unnecessary and it becomes, un, you know, untenable to get them all in. Um, so if we took perhaps the same block of time and dribble them out an hour at a time through the week, I think that might be a better, a better format. Ron Gondwana, Alyssa covered most of what I was going to say, but just generally the idea that if you say, would you like some unstructured time, everyone will say yes. If you say, do you want, don't, do you not want your meetings to conflict, everyone will say yes. Um, if you don't propose it in the way of a trade-off and what the pros and cons are, then people are just going to say, yes, I'd like one of everything, please. That's why one of the questions that I had for all of you is how you would like to balance the unstructured time with the working group time. Andy Malice, um, speaking both as a chair and as a general participant, um, people ha kind of have an expectation of what their IETF week is going to look like. And uh, I think in the book, case of both 103 and 104, it w would have been better to have gotten um, certainly a lot more warning um, th that the schedule w was going to look different. And this is what we're going to be doing d differently than what we've done in the past. Um, that would have been useful. And, and then just looking ahead for scheduling, um, you know, we have an IETF coming up in Madrid. And, uh, and, you know, and like we did in Buenos Aires, um, we'll probably want to be adjusting um, to the local customs there. And so that would be good to also announce well in advance as well. So two things there are the last. First, we, the first time I recall us doing a shift for that was Paris in 2004, where we permanently, it turns out, changed the schedule and eliminated the evening things by shifting things later and stuff like that. So, you know, we are responding to that and looking at how they work out. Um, Sorry, just what was the first thing that you said very briefly? Oh, it's better. Um, if a warning, you... sorry. Warning. Yes, yes, warning. We, we think we did give a sufficient warning. So maybe one of the questions is how can we better communicate this so that people are more aware of it? Do you have any ideas about that? Uh, well, certainly, you know, a general broadcast on the IETF list, uh, you know, as early as possible, just saying, you know, be aware for the upcoming IETF we're doing, you know, with a, you know Wednesday afternoon um, experiment with unstructured time. And, and so you, you can plan your week um, based on that. And, and we believe we did that. So oh, okay. uh, Alyssa got back in the queue and she can address that. <laughs> but, okay, thank you. Okay, cool, thanks. Ben Kadek again. Uh, interestingly enough, I had gotten into the queue to raise essentially this topic before Andy started talking. Uh, and I guess the situation is maybe a little bit less clear than anybody has been saying so far. Uh, and I guess Robert had also started to ask about sort of the question of warning. Uh, and so maybe yes, we think that we did say we're, we're thinking about having unstructured time well in advance. Uh, but as we've been discussing on the working group chairs list, uh, we didn't really say, yes, we are definitely having unstructured time and it will be at this time. Um, until the, the draft agenda came out. And there's been a lot of people saying on that list and, and here that you know, having a concrete indication earlier would be good. But from the point of view of, of scheduling this stuff, uh, if we're gonna make an early commitment to having unstructured time in a specific time, well, we have to make that commitment. And there's a cost to that, which means that it constrains the scheduling of the structured time. And so, to me at least, the question that I have, and I don't know the answer to, is whether this unstructured time is sufficiently useful and good enough that we do want to make that early commitment. Uh, because I think for, for 104, we were perhaps not entirely sure that we were gonna do it or how, what it was gonna look like until we knew what session requests we got and how we could schedule them. I'm going to um, cut the line for this topic after okay. Brian. I uh, agree with everything that Ben said. For 103, 
we announced this in May and the meeting was in November. So we announced for 103 before, a couple months before 102. Um, I think we're unlikely to ever do better than that for something which we call an experiment. Uh, that's a lot of lead time. Um, and we knew we wanted to do that because it would affect people's travel plans. That's why we did it that far in advance. So. Uh, Brian Rosen, um, <clears throat> slightly very small, slight variation on this topic, but specifically to um, side meetings. Um, I've, there, there is a policy against not allowing remote participation. Not a resource limit, but a policy. You can't have remote support for a side meeting. I think that's a problem. It is a problem. I have this very problem. I have four or five people who desperately wanted to get into a side meeting and can't, and I'd like to have that dealt with. Noted, thanks. You can't necessarily assume that there's not, also, there's not a resource limitation for side meetings that um, occur concurrently with other things that are going on. Yeah. Sure. Because we only have yeah, yes, hours. sure. If it, was, if it was just a resource limit, I absolutely understand that and wouldn't want you to add resources for that, but to just say no, Without we having an actual right. constraint, is we've noted the request. I yeah, thank and, you. And just offline, could you maybe send me where the policy is documented so I can refresh my memory? So one one more thing I want to I want to veer a little bit on this still on this topic. Are you finding the wiki to set up the unstructured time to be an effective way to? show the schedule of the unstructured time sessions. Do you have other need, needs that aren't being met by that that you can suggest for some small amount of tooling or a different way of presenting the information? Ben Campbell's an individual. I don't have an answer to that question, so I'm going to step back and see if anyone wants to jump in front of me. It doesn't look like anyone's jumping, so go ahead with what you want. I was just up here to make the observation that the unstructured time seems to be filling with structure. <laughs> so, so uh, which makes me wonder how much people, how much use people are getting it to be able to do ad hoc things like, I just realized five minutes ago I need to have a conversation to find the right people. Uh, yeah, this beat. Um, I, to echo what he just said, I went looking for some time to get together with the directorate that I run, and there was no time left on that structured schedule. Whereas if it was, you know, yeah, making room reservations is nice, but having some of these big rooms available with corners that could just be assigned to people would be a much easier way to go. Right. So you, in other words, we, we are engineers and we tend to put structure on unstructured things. Yes. Okay, the other topic that I had that I wanted to talk about here was that the IESG has started discussing helping you help the community to make a cultural change about behavior in meetings and on mailing lists. And I'm not talking about the harassment end of things, which we have covered. I'm talking about the general demeanor with which we operate and the fact that people have come to us both in the plenary and offline and said, I or people I know have been driven away by the way people are treated in the IETF. Some of it has gotten better, some of it has not. And I have a, a list of some things that, if uh, I should have brought my reading glasses, but I didn't. Um, but you know, we're talking about things like name calling and o other overtly nasty language that I think most of us can agree we shouldn't do. To things that, there's a line somewhere, there's, and, and that line is gonna vary from person to person, things that aren't black and white. Things we might call unprofessional behavior and bullying and, and sarcasm and things like that, where at some point it's still okay and at some point it's not, and it's tough to, to judge. So I'm not going to go through the list, 
but I'm going to say what the bottom line is that in, in my notes is that we want to encourage people to stick to technical arguments and not talk about uh, a person's affiliation, motives, qualifications, um, country they come from, any of that stuff. Stick to the technical arguments and explain why you disagree rather than saying that's a stupid idea or otherwise being dismissive. What I'd like to see, and, and when I say I, we've discussed this in the IESG, but I'm really giving my personal opinion right now, is for the community as a whole to say, essentially, dude, we don't treat people that way here. So that people who come can see that that's, it's the culture. And I think it's, it's you guys, it's, it's the working group chairs who are best suited to passing this to the working groups and enabling people in the working group to, to do that. Um, I'd be interested in any discussion you have about what I said and how we can help you do that and that sort of thing. Or whether you don't want to do that and why. I think it sounds like, this is Barbara Stark, I think it sounds like a good idea. I would like to add one additional element to that list of, I guess, demographic characteristics. Um, it's been noticed by a number of people that operators are rather underrepresented, and they seem surprised to me when I tell them one of the reasons operators stay away is because often a list goes, a discussion is along the lines of, well, those operators are stupid and they don't know what they're doing. And it may come as a surprise to people, but that kind of turns off a lot of people as well. So that's an additional demographic of why a lot of people I know and I work with really try to avoid the IETF. Um, I do think it is something, and I think it's something where I have tried um, in some of the things I chair or contribute to to simply push back and, you know, that's not a good thing to say. And oftentimes I'll do it privately, sometimes I'll do it on the list. So well, that, that just leads me to tell a story about at the, uh, what do we call it, uh, right before the newcomers meet and greet when we've got the Wes was running this thing like where the, the, the newbies jump, go from table to table. And I, I was at one of the tables and some people came over. One of them was an operator. And he said he's been avoiding the IETF for years and finally got sort of pushed into coming to one. And I said, well, tell me something about why. And he said, because uh, frankly, I'm, I belong, I, I participate in enough toxic organizations and I don't need another one. Um, now, to be fair, he added Nanog to that list of toxic organizations, so it isn't just us, but that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm looking at. And he, and he, as an operator, he felt particularly called out there. Mary. Okay, Mary Barnes. So, uh, I mean, I agree with your point that we shouldn't behave in certain ways. I think, yeah, make it for normal height people. Okay. <laughs> Not Ben height. Okay, and so, and so my, my, my challenge, and you called me out, right? I, I had, there was a sarcastic thread. It wasn't a technical thing. It was about the agenda. And I personally thought, and, and I don't know if any of those people are in the room, but I, it was one of the silliest discussions I thought I ever had. And I got sarcastic because, you know, I was grumpy. Um, and some of the people were fine with it. Like one of the people I know really well, and I know he didn't take it personally, right? And the other person was an experienced person, although I don't know them very well, so they probably hate me now. Um, and <laughs> so the thing is, you called me out. We had to, you know, I need to find nicer words to use sometimes. And that's fine, I'll do it. The thing is, you need to call people out when you see it, because we don't always realize that we're causing that problem. Right? We're just, and I made that point on the work group chairs list. We're not the most socially attuned people in the world, right? Um, and like I said, my mother has tried to, to, to deal with it, but she failed miserably. So we need to help each other, right? Talk to somebody after a meeting, right? Or if it's really bad during a meeting, stand up and say that's not acceptable, right? Thank you, Mary. Why do we give affiliations when standing at the mic? I'm sorry, say it again? Yeah, sorry, my name is Rich. Why do we give affiliations when standing at the mic? Yeah, I, we, we have been encouraged to. I don't, we, what we really push you to is say who, what, what your name is, um, and many people state their affiliations, but I, I'm not aware that people have been really pushed 
to say their affiliations well, in general. There may be yeah, some working groups. I think the common them. practice is, I've, is that people will say, you know, Ecker Mozilla, Rich Sauls, Akamai, or whatever, and therefore the newcomers come up and say it and pick a prove it random operators, you know, or enterprise data center people, they feel like they're painting a target on their back. So maybe we should actively discourage that. And just say, when you come to the mic, say only your name. Okay. Uh, Kent Watson, when this conversation came up on the list, I made the suggestion that perhaps a, a something akin to the note well could be made, or um, and then uh, each chair could flash a slide at uh, the beginning of their working group session. That just something along the lines of, you know, these are the parameters that we try to run our working groups by. Um, not that we would have to do this for every ITF meeting going forward, but, you know, one meeting once a year, perhaps that's all we need. The reason for that is because it gives the chairs the cover to then um, make a statement during the meeting of, hey, you know, remember that slide from the ISG, um, you know, because if the chairs are just having to make the statement on their own, um, they may not feel empowered, right? That, that, that they don't have the, the backing. They don't have to take the blame. They don't have to take the heat. They can say, "I'm just, I'm just re referring or, or, re or repeating the information that was provided from above." So. Okay. It's Pete, and I was always under the impression that Rich's last name was Akamai, but <laughs> um, there you go. Kind of like Larry Spamhouse. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, uh, something Mary said kicked in my head, which is um, a lot of the people who are ill-socialized enough to do goofy things, not because they're being mean, but because they're ill-socialized, also don't react too badly if you say, please stop that, um, because they're not offended by you telling them that they were being ill-socialized. They're used to it. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ron. That was very good. Uh, the other one, though, that I thought might be useful, a lot of times people get wound up in working group meetings, especially at the mic, by making arguments about something that's pissing them off. And I, as a chair, I think it's useful, and you can set this up by putting parameters on the discussion beforehand, but also when people are speaking, to say, what do we do? Make it an engineering question. What do you want the document to say? What, what should the change be? Can we leave this alone? Does this need to move to a different working group? What, what's the outcome? Not why it's bad, don't care. What's the outcome that you want? And that will tend to turn the people away from getting personal about stuff. Thanks, Pete, that's a good one. Uh, ben Campbell, so, so two points, just reacting to what's been said in the line. When we talked about naming our affiliations, it wasn't but a couple of years ago where people were at the mic of the plenary asking us to do that. So I don't do it personally, and, and I agree with the idea that we probably shouldn't. I think it fits what we at least claim as our culture better to not do it. But I do want to keep in mind that there are people in the IETF who have been asking us to do that, and I think they do that because they understand that corporate money influences policy and et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are concerns both ways. So I think we have to be a little careful on that point on how we balance things. Uh, the other one is <clears throat> I think we should be, and this is just kind of a nit, but we, we keep coming up with new things and we keep thinking maybe we should add it to note well or add it to a slide at the beginning of working groups. Everything we add to that dilutes everything else. And we're already to the point where the note well is very, very dense. And pretty much a lot of working group chairs, myself included, just throw it up and say, note it well, move on. They just assume everyone knows what it says. If we need to convey new information, we need to find new ways to do it. Ben Kadak, so with respect to the whole you know, name your affiliation thing, uh, personally, I don't, uh, but I was in the smart bath, I guess it was, and the chairs, or one of the chairs explicitly said, please state your name and affiliation. And I, I thought about getting up and, and objecting to it at the time, but because it was a, a bath that was targeting a research group, I did not really feel like I had the standing to make a formal objection. And uh, we'll cut it off after Adam. Okay, Mary Barnes again. So I have two points. On the thing about affiliation, there is a service provider that's not here this time, and you will never get him to stop saying his affiliation. And if you try and get him to stop, then he gets angry, and so you really don't want to do that. So 
don't make a big deal about it with certain people. Um, and then on the, you know, the snark or sarcasm, that's my, I'm a special, special, specialized in sarcasm. Um, mine was on a discussion with an AD, okay? So it has to come from the top as well, right? They need to think, and it was because the person yes. didn't carefully consider what I put in an email, right? So it's, you know, it's got to come from you people too. It, it does, and, and I didn't mean to say that, to imply that it doesn't. Um, yeah, Adam. Adam Roach, I just wanted to put a fine point on what Ben was saying, which is presently the note well slide actually does have pointers to at least two documents that bear specifically on this. So, so yeah, it's... A point right, and, and a bullet point. I mean, yes. So, I mean, it is specifically covered in the note well. It's just that there is so much stuff there that unless you tell chairs you need to spend five minutes on this slide, it's going to get lost. And that's not a useful like way to spend people's time. Yeah, I, I agree that we don't want to put up more boilerplate slides in front of every session. At, at MOG, the messaging anti-abuse working group, they have a conduct policy and uh, you know, don't talk about this and talk about that. And every session has three or four slides like that. And it does get tedious throughout the meeting. Ron Gondwana, sorry, Barry, I know you just closed off the line, but something that came up from this was that we do the note well at the start of every single session. If we made it five minutes of solid work, that would be a lot of repetition throughout yes. the week. The ITF has no starting meeting that everyone goes to where you could present something like this. Uh, is that something that's worth bringing back, is going through that at the very start and then spending a decent amount of time on the note well and on guidelines for behaviour throughout the meeting once? So, taken. Thank you. Yep. And just to be clear, this is Kent again, just to be clear, I wasn't actually saying add it to the know well, although that's not a bad idea. I was saying a special slide just on this point. I understand. And, and in general, anytime there's a new thing that you would want to add to a note well, just create a slide for that point, and then you let the chairs flash that slide for one meeting only, and then put it in the note well and it disappears. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so Kent. then there's one more thing I just want to say, and then I'm Brian. done. Brian. Um, yeah, go ahead, Karen. Sorry, I just I didn't want to get up and walk all the way over there. If you don't mind, there's just a couple of things I wanted to point out. I just stuck this slide up here because it's in the newcomers overview. Uh, I'm not real fond of the slide. I think it's kind of silly to tell people to remember to sleep, but you know, um, uh, but help with the kind of language that we have here, just like three or four bullets. So this is what we're telling the newcomers, and I wanted people to know that that's what we're telling the newcomers. And the second thing I wanted to point out was we kind of glossed over it, but in Francesca's presentation, she had that the gap. The first gap was obligations and responsibilities. And we were sort of looking like, you know, what are the 10 things that we, you know, one sentence each, what are the 10 things we wanted uh, the working group chairs to, to remember that they're responsible for? And one of them would be maintaining appropriate decorum in their working group. And one of them would be, you know, make sure you pay attention to the IPR policy. So um, Francesca could probably really use some help with developing that. So talk to her about that. Thank you. And while you have this slide up, I'll, I'll point out one thing I'd like to add to the third bullet. Talk to people and listen to them. And that's right. a large part of the, the issue that we have sometimes. Oh, so, you know what? I think I took listen out. Uh, <laughs> so um, if... Again, what I, one of the reasons I got up here was to encourage the chairs to help us pass this around through the community and use your positions to do that. If I post my notes that I was looking at on my iPad to the working group chairs mailing list and start a little discussion there, are people interested in doing that? Okay, I see nods. I don't see anybody running out of the room. Thanks for giving me the time. Okay, um, at this point we have uh, 10 minutes left. It's open mic. Does anybody have anything else they want to bring to the working group chairs forum? Okay, I don't see any people at the mic. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention at the very end of all of this is um, with Miriam stepping down and some of the other changes that are ongoing, we're going to um, take a look at a, a number of these programs. And so if, if people have any thoughts on what this particular uh, forum useful, not useful, used to, it used to be training, um, feel free to mail the edu ma mailing list um, or, or send feedback to whoever. There'll be more details coming out, but I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. So go ahead, Ben. Ben Kaduk. Yeah, I was just sort of curious if anybody had had issues with remote presenters, because um, I know we do have, uh, through Meet Echo, the option to give them like a special presenter mode versus just standing in the microphone line and, and pushing the red button. 
Right, no, there, there is, but not everybody's been using it. Um, right. And you know, I, I think I sent an email out like Sunday or something pointing this out, but uh, was that email helpful? You know, Mary Monks again. So we, we had a remote presenter. I didn't find out until like the, very late. And so we, we did it the way where we just pressed the button. And I think it worked okay, right? So I mean, I think, think you know, and then we also, I was proud of us. I didn't realize we had a um, newcomer actually present in our session. So, yeah. Um, you have near, never mind my affiliation. Uh, so um, I see this a lot with uh, remote presenters that, uh, it always starts with, uh, oh, was this thing on, or they start out muted because they muted it for their previous presentations. There's always some technical stuff, and um, usually they're incredibly loud. I mean, compared to somebody just talking to the room mic, they're incredibly loud. You can hear them. We know when somebody's remotely presenting in the other room because we're hearing them through the walls, especially here. So there's something to do and the, the presenter mode helps with some things i presented once like that but um there are other technical issues that are not really addressed by the presenter mode i yeah jonathan lennox i mean i think that this is more from observing other working groups than in mine but um it, it'd be good i don't know how technically easy this is for me to go but if it's possible to get somebody you know, you did not have to prearrange the remote presenter mode because um, when you have a real remote presenter, then you actually have both the remote queue and the remote presenter simultaneously, um, as opposed to the remote presenter just being the person who's at the front of the queue. Um, and often, you know, as a chair, you don't realize till the last minute, oh, hey, this person isn't here or they missed their flight or whatever. We need to have somebody remote present right away. And while the queue thing works, it would be nicer if we could get a, you know, if there were a way to turn somebody into a real remote presenter at the, at, 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 on, at the last minute. Of you, I mean, I, I will say, having done this a few times, Meet Echo uh, tries pretty hard to accommodate. Uh, and so they will, if you get a last minute one, they'll try to work with you. Uh, just as a, a side note, uh, the, well, oh, go ahead, Ben. Ben Kadek, yeah, I have also noted that. And I've also noted times where we discover there's going to be a remote presenter like during the session, you know, two talks later, and Meet Echo gets them set up like right. during the session. Uh, but I was sort of you know, brainstorming on the fly. Uh, perhaps Meet Echo could like give a presenter like backup URL just to the chairs, and the chairs could have that handy to send to, to the send to them. remote people as needed. Oh, that's a good idea. I, I would uh, encourage people to use the remote presenter thing because the other thing it does, I've used, I mean, I, it's happened both ways in, in my working group and I'll have to say that if, if it's planned in advance, then then there's an opportunity for testing and all sorts of other things, uh, which generally leads to a better result. So, any other questions? Oh, with that we end six minutes early. Thank you all. Have a good day. <laughs>